there's an international commons movement that you probably know about, and it is uh, a very inspiring movement, and, and you're part of it. You're, I mean, we're all uh, creating the language for it, but we're, we're all discovering the language as we go. And what I really want to talk about here, no, I'm not able to move my cursor. The commons, as we've been defining it in more recent terms, has, it has its origins in a 1968 article in Science Journal uh, by Garrett Hardin, who talked about uh, a pasture that uh, a bunch of herders put their cattle into. And his point was that if there's no incentive for individual herders to limit the number of cattle that they graze in the pasture, it inevitably leads to overgrazing and destruction of that, of that commons. And he called it the tragedy of the commons. So he said, inevitably, this is going to happen. We're going to have failed commons. And whenever there's a failed commons, we need the private sector to intervene or the state to intervene. And that's the natural solution to the, to the uh, tragedy of the commons. People like Eleanor Ostrom and others in the commons movement at that time, uh, in the 1970s, um, said, well, what he's talking about is not a commons. He's talking about open access which is a, uh, a set of common pool resources. That's not the commons. Common pool resources are unorganized, unclaimed resources, as opposed to open source, which is organized resources through informal practices, norms, and rules. This is a very key distinction, and this is a distinction that now, because of the word open source, we have, um, we have been much better able to understand. <coughs> The word commons kind of uh, has a variety of meanings, but the one that strikes me the most as the most interesting is that they're inherited or created gifts that we organize, use, and steward during our <laughs> lifetimes through informal practices and rules which we pass on to future generations. And by the way, note the word organized there and also the word rules because that comes up later in this story that I'm telling you. <laughs> So we recognize there are two modes of commons. One is, are the traditional commons, the indigenous cultures, the, the arts, the natural uh, resources uh, in the world. There are also the emerging commons, like the internet and social networks and the intellectual property. So we recognize that there's something similar between them, that they're both open source rather than open access. Now, it doesn't mean that common pool resources are bad. It just means that they're unorganized. And when a group comes into a common pool resource and begins to organize it, then it becomes a commons. The key elements of the commons, as many of the commons researchers in various disciplines have identified, are resources, community, boundaries, rules, and value. Resources can be either depletable resources or replenishable resources. And there's a, a distinct difference between them, obviously. Community involves producers and managers and providers and users of a resource. The boundaries of the commons represent the extent of the resource as well as the membership of that particular uh, community that manages the resource or produces the resource. The rules have to do with preservation of the resource, access to the resource, the use of the resource, governance of the resource, and also the production of the resource. And value arises from the gifts of nature, from the natural world, from the capacities and cultures of past generations, as well as the collective capacities of people today. Carl Palladian uh, talked about how we've transitioned from society-centered markets with rural households and matriarchal cultures and credit-based economies to what we have today, market-centered societies, urban markets, patriarchal cultures, and debt-based economies. How did we lose the commons exactly? Well, a very quick rundown of how we lost it, we moved from inalienable rights to the alienated rights that we have today, <coughs> from commodification when earlier cultures experienced virtual credit economies and gift cultures, we have commodification into the commodities today, the alienation of the, of the gift, the enclosure of property which took place 
because customary law then became civil law over the past several centuries. The division of labor between producers and workers, as we know about. The universal standard of value, which made all goods fungible, which meant that use value was transformed into exchange value. And then private and public goods, which we know today. We know what the private sector provides and the commercial marketplace. We know that the state provides certain goods like security and uh, certain uh, means of social uh, programs for, for the public. Over the last couple centuries, and particularly in the last 40 years, we can see the emergence of a duopoly, a market state, in which the two principles, market and state, have really begun to fuse together, even though they are still distinct. But they blend together in a very unique way. The commons is a reaction to that duopoly that's emerged. Under liberal capitalism, the market was the primary source of freedom because the idea that people could have individual incentives was extremely critical to the development of the early ideology around the market. Uh, the state, of course, was to provide equality. Those two ideals, freedom and equality, have been completely distorted through capital accumulation and wealth consolidation economic and social inequality, through interest-bearing money and debt, through enforcement of private property, through sovereign boundaries, and through state coercion. In modern society, the debate is whether or not the market should, whether or not government should intervene more or less in the marketplace. And that dominates the headlines, it dominates all our politics. The, the rationale is that the, from the market standpoint, of course, there should be less government and more economic freedom from the state side, it's more government and more, and more social economy. But in the process of this debate, which is a false dichotomy, completely ignored are people and their common resources, completely taken for granted. So where is the third sector? Where is the countervailing balance that will set everything right? Is it civil society? Well, civil society has been trying hard, but unfortunately, civil society is still subject to private ownership models, which it endorses. It doesn't challenge the constitutional premises behind, um, behind uh, private property. And it doesn't involve resource users in the production of their own resources. It hasn't figured that out yet, except for uh, people in the field of international development who work at the grassroots and understand that people have to develop themselves from the ground up. No foreign aid. People have to do it from themselves. Um, that's an exception to the rule, but in general, my observation is civil society hasn't completely got it right yet, and that's why it hasn't created a third sector that is a viable force that will have to transform the market and the state. The commons provides something that civil society can really learn from. Again, the commons is groups of people producing and organizing their own resources and creating value through their practices, norms, and rules. This the commons devolves power to local communities through pluralism, through subsidiarity, through polycentrism, checks and balances, and horizontal democracy. Commons ends the division of labor between producers and workers and users because the workers and users become the producers of their own resources. Commons restores democratic decision making through co governance, co production social charters, and commons trust. Now, whereas Marx talked about ownership of the means of production, commoners are talking about the production of the means of non-ownership or trusteeship. We're not talking about collective ownership. This is a big confusion in the field. Collective ownership is fine. Cooperatives are great. They are commons. But ultimately, the vision of the commons is to move from ownership to trusteeship. This commons transforms property from private ownership models and state ownership models to a commons trusteeship. It redefines resource boundaries, resource domains. So now we're talking, instead of that duopoly between <coughs> private and public uh, sectors, now in providing private and public goods, now we're talking about common goods. This is a completely new shift and it really makes sense in terms of 
where society is evolving. It makes great sense in terms of the kinds of things that occupy his envision. Commons restores the vision of democracy. Now, remember back in the earlier definition we were talking about the market. The definition of the market, if you talk to von, von Hayek or whoever you like to, to speak of, they're always talking about this, or Adam Smith or whoever, they talk about the spontaneous self-organizing system of the market. How that is a, a, the hand of God. It's, a, it's the, hand, the invisible hand of the marketplace. Okay, fine. And they say it works. Yes, it does work to an extent, as long as it's not distorted. The state's vision of a rule-based society sounds good on paper. In practice, it doesn't work so well. But the vision of this self-organizing system and a rule-based society is expressed in the commons through the self-organizing communities that produce and manage their own resources through informal practices, norms, and rules. So the commons grounds the ideals that we've had in liberal democracy into a workable format, into a framework that can um, become a, uh, a living vision of democracy. So that the market, which expresses the principles of freedom, and the state that talks about equality, now those ideals can be expressed in the level of the commons, because people are participating actively in their own culture. Resources, resource users become the producers of their own resources, and ownership is transformed into trusteeship. The commons is a reaction to the enclosure movement, which enclosed the commons in the first place over the past several centuries. When government and market enclosures remove people from the sources of their living wealth and sustenance, we're talking about a non-closure movement. Occupy the commons would be a, re a reaction to the fact that governments and markets are not the solution to failed commons, as Garrett Hardin said, but they're the cause of the overuse and degradation of the commons today. Our job is to roll back the enclosures that deny the rights of people to their means of survival and livelihood and well-being. And enclosures that don't promote life, human dignity, security, and peace. Our job is to occupy all the commons and put them all into one basket that we can envision. Social, cultural, intellectual, digital, solar, natural commons, genetic, material commons. Now we begin to envision these resource boundaries in a new way. We, there's two steps here. The first is to take the green space and say, this is our domain. This is where our identity. This is who we are. And then a recognition that in the space of the red and in the space of the blue on this diagram, the private goods and public goods, they have their place to an extent. But the whole discourse has to be around where the boundaries are, where the, where the uh, gray areas are in between each of these circles, each of these spheres, and negotiations around those resource domains. So that's the second step. First is the identity around the fact that we are commoners. And the second is that where the resource domains actually end up and, and leave off. So in those spaces that are gray areas, we have to begin to negotiate and roll back uh, areas like water privatization or fracking or uh, the various issues that we are aware of as commons issues. Why do we occupy? Because the world's financial system, which is in crisis, won't be solved until we have a new international monetary system. We're not going to have a new international monetary system until we solve the ecological and energy crisis. We're not going to solve the ecological and energy crisis until we have low carbon production and trade. We're not going to get to the point of low carbon production trade until we redefine the boundaries of resource domains. So if we're going to transform the economy and government into component parts of the biosphere, we have to redefine the boundaries of resource domains. And that means occupy the commons. Thank you.